Jimmy's got so much that he's done and that he's doing. I'm going to kind of let him talk a little bit about that. If, if any of you have the opportunity, the Pursuit Channel has uh, Spiritual Outdoor Adventures. That's Jimmy's show. When I, when I was not saved, I was a hunter. I was an outdoorsman that knew who Jesus was. When you hear Jimmy speak, you're going to hear about a guy that knows who Jesus is, and he hunts when he gets a chance to. And so, it's my honor to introduce Jimmy Sites for 2021 March Radio Call. How many of you have a dog? I have three. How many of you have either or all a wife, a child, a grandchild, a, uh, let's see, an employee? An employer, a neighbor, or a friend. <laughs> All right. Well, what I'm going to share with you today, I want it to be worth your while that you've taken time away from your work and your schedule to be here. I want you to go home with something that's going to be beneficial. And I can promise you this. What I'm going to tell you is going to work in every single relationship that you have in a positive way, and that includes the relationship with your dog. But I'm also going to just go have to tell you up front, it's extremely radical. <laughs> so we need to come to an agreement, all right? I don't know how you guys work up here, but in Nashville, we have gentleman's word. It's kind of like that handshake contract. So you got to give me your word that, that you'll do one thing. Allow me to present everything before you make your final judgment. Then if you decide kick me out of the state, don't ever let him back in the county, don't ever bring him back, get him off that thing he's going to be doing over at Chippewa Falls in, in August, we don't even want him back. That's your prerogative, you can go there. But at least hear me out. And then make your judgment. Are you willing to do that? You got it. Handshake deal? Yep. Alright, here we go. I'm going to start with a man who at the age of 38 is going to retire as a multimillionaire, almost the billionaire level. And this banquet is being held in his honor. And the rumor got out that at the retirement banquet, this man was going to share his secret for success. And so everybody showed up. The leaders of the Fortune 500 companies, people from the big networks on TV, the radio stations, even the book publishers, they're all wanting the contract on this guy so they can have a number one New York Times bestseller business book from his great information that he's going to give. Well, the night came for the banquet, the meal was good, the dessert was even better, and then they, they did a roast of the guy and had a lot of fun. And then it came his time to get up, and he was very gracious, and he thanked everyone from the podium and said quite a number of words. And finally he said, I'm not going to just keep going on because I know a lot of you came just to hear my secret for success tonight, and I'm now ready to unveil it. Man, everybody sat up in the room, and back in the old days we'd be licking our pencils and getting our paper out. Well, they're all getting their electronic gadgets out and hitting record on it. And the LED lights came on on the cameras in the back of the room, and they didn't care if it was going to take two hours for this guy to present it. Everybody was so excited to hear his secret for success, this formula that would bless their lives. So you can only imagine the surprise in the room when the man said only three one-syllable words. He said, my secret for success is this. And... Then, some. That's it. And then he went on. I, I can see you're a little bit confused, so let me explain. When I was in the first grade, I came across this bit of teaching, and it said this. Do whatever is expected of you. Say it with me. And then some. So I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And I remember when our first grade teacher would make assignments and once every month a different student would have to miss a little bit of recess to take the trash out. And I thought I'm going to give this a try. So I took the trash out, came back, looked for a trash bag to line the, new, uh, the, the, the empty trash can, found it under the sink, put it on there, actually went over to the teacher's desk, it was pretty messy, I organized her papers, I sharpened her pencils, I polished her apple and set it on a napkin. And then I went out and played. It only took me about five or six minutes that I missed on recess, so it was fine. We all came back into class, and my teacher sat down, and she stood back up, and she said, Who came to my desk? Who, who was at my desk? And I'm thinking, Oh, no, I'm in trouble. And I timidly raised my hand, and she said, Will you come up here? Again, I'm thinking I'm in trouble, and I walk to the front of the room, and she comes over to me, and she says, In all the years I've been teaching, I've never had a student to actually find a trash bag and line the trash can with it, and then organize my desk. 
and she was patting me on the head and she's giving me a hug and I look up and I see kind of a tear in her eye and all the class is clapping for me and I, I'm thinking this actually works so I thought I'll try this at home it was my night that I had to wash the dishes and put them in the dishwasher and my mom reminded me as she always had to do and I thought well I'm just gonna give this a try and so I washed the dishes and put them in the dishwasher and then I went over and I got all the garbage and I tied up the bag and I took it out to the street corner and I put it in the can and I came back and when I walked in the door my mom's looking at me she said what are you doing and I said well I, I just thought I would take the trash out for you and she came and gave me a big hug and she said honey that's so sweet and I look up and there's that tear thing kind of welling up in her eye right there and so wow it's beginning to hit me that that this going the second mile concept this and then some really truly works and so by the time I'm in the fifth grade they asked me to be a school crossing guard usually they pick a sixth grader and by the time I'm in junior I'm playing sports and and I'm playing basketball and we're in the semifinals of the county tournament and it's two seconds in the game our team is one point down I get fouled I'm at the free throw line and I'm not a very good free throw shooter and I remember I was so nervous and I bounced the ball and I, and I shot all I had to do was make it to tie and then make the next one to win and I missed the first one our season's over we got knocked out of the county tournament boy after the season I thought you know I gotta practice free throws and I did but the next season it was still pretty much the same and my coach came to me one day and he said why don't you stay after practice and shoot like an extra 25 free throws once or twice a week so I thought to myself I'm gonna do whatever my coach expects of me say it with me and then some so I stayed every day after practice and guess how many free throws I shot 50 exactly and so we get to the county tournament and I know this sounds kind of fluffy as if I'm making this up but I'm really not it's the finals this time we're down to the last few seconds and I got fouled again and we're playing the same team and so evidently they're remembering the template from the previous year <laughs> and I'm like uh foul him but boy they didn't know who they were getting this time I walked up to the line with confidence I dribbled twice flipped the ball twice got my gooseneck ready to go so when I shoot I got that proper gooseneck and later my parents asked me did you see all those people under the basket waving their coats and yelling at you I said no I didn't because I was in the zone first shot whew, tied the game second shot whew, won the game and my my teammates carried me out on their shoulders that spring we had a sports banquet at school and I got a little trophy I still have it in my office best free throw percentage shooter of the team 84.5 percent I realized what this could do for me if I would do whatever is expected of me and then some I applied it to my grades I applied it to being the uh, running for student body president at my high school in a student council and I used that as my slogan and I won and we had an awesome council that would do whatever the student body expected of us and then some and I got valedictorian in my high school, got to pick which college I wanted to go to, applied the same principles there, was the student leader there, the president, the student body there, and I surrounded myself with other college students that wanted to do whatever body expected of them, and then some. And so when spring break happened my senior year, instead of going off to, to uh, Florida, our group went to the town where the tornado hit, and we helped Habitat for Humanity build a house or two. And we didn't seek it, but we had national coverage on it. Look at what these college students are doing compared to these. I applied the same thing to my grades, and I remember my senior year in college, I clipped out of all of my final exams because I already had all my A's. And so I was there for a final, uh, an, uh, the last week and didn't have anything to do. So I went to this professor that I really admired a lot, and I, I said, do you have any kind of research subject that you've always wanted to, to get involved in, maybe write a book on, but you've never really had the time to research it? And he said, yeah, actually, there, there's something, and he told me about it. I said, that's interesting. So I headed over to the library. Now, this is back when they had Dewey Decimal System. The young guy's like, what is that? And you pull open these drawers, and you dig through, and you get this number, and you go look up the book, and didn't have internet back then. We had a microfiche thing. Now, that's, you don't catch that. You have to, you know, look it up. And I was printing out all this stuff, and I came out after five days of research with about two inches thick of copied papers on this. And I went to my professor, knocked on the door, and I said, sir, I, I did some research for you. I'd like for you to have this. And he stood up and began to look at it. And he, his eyes got big, and it was as if he, he was hit with a cattle prod. 
And he shook my hand. He said, son, I have never had a student do this. This is amazing. I, I will give you the best reference. And I said, sir, I didn't do it for a reference. I just do it as a thank you because you've taught me so much. And he wouldn't let go of my hand and he's shaking it. And once again, I look and I see like this, this tear kind of welling up in that one duct over there. And I'm thinking, this really works. I got my pick of, of uh, the businesses because I was the valedictorian or whatever they call it of the college. I think you call it magna cum laude or something like that. Magna cum laude, summa, summa cum laude, cum laude. And then there's guys like me and Rich over here. Praise the Lord. He's out of this college, you know. <laughs> but this guy's is it magna cum laude. He's top of the class. So, of course, he's going to get his pick, right? And he goes to this favorite company where some of the people that are sitting on the board are books, you know, writers of books that he's read. And he's in the boardroom the first day and he's like, you know, a kid in a candy store. And these, these board guys and ladies are telling him, here's what we expect of you. You get two weeks of vacation. You're to be at work at, you know, 8.30 in the morning. You're off at 4.30 in the afternoon. You get a one-hour lunch break. You have two secretaries working for you. Here's your budget, blah, blah. And all the while, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to do whatever this board of directors expects of me and then some. So this guy, he starts doing that. I'll just kind of step aside and we'll look at him now. That's exactly what he began to apply. And he would come in about 8 in the morning, leave about 5 in the afternoon, give him an extra hour. But he didn't want to be a workaholic. He was very, very consistent at having free time, which we all need to do. He also would not take a full hour for lunch. He's one of these frugal guys that's not going to go out to a restaurant and spend a lot of money. He's bringing his own lunch. He can eat it in 20 minutes. So he kind of segmented it up. 20 minutes to eat, 20 minutes to have a midday devotional, 20 minutes to help my secretaries. And he would go to them and say, what can I help you do? Is there any project you're working on you need help with? They loved this guy. And they loved working for him. It's not going to surprise you when I tell you he began to be promoted more quickly than those that had been at the company longer. And during that period of time, he also found a godly young lady, he married her, and he decided, I'm going to do whatever my wife expects of me, and then some. And he had a great marriage, and they had kids, and he was that way as a father, and he began to be involved in coaching and in community events, and, and he decided, I'm going to pour myself into my community, and then some. And he was loved and successful at all that he did. And he became the first, or the youngest, president of that Fortune 500 company in the history of the business world in America. And he decided to lead that company with this philosophy. I'm going to do whatever our consumers expect of our company and then some. And they had their best years. One day he called the board in. He was around 32, 33. And he reluctantly told them and had his letter ready that he was resigning. They didn't want to accept it. And he assured them, I am not unhappy. I'm so thankful for the fact that you've allowed me to lead this company. I'm so blessed. I could be here the rest of my life. But I've got this one dream that I would love to try to accomplish. And I'm afraid if I don't do it now, I never will. And I want to start my own retail store. So he resigned and he went and started one single retail store. And he hired college students to help him run it. And he taught them. He said, we're going to do whatever the customer expects of it. Say it with me. And then some. Does it surprise you that was a successful store pretty quickly? He made enough profit to open the second one and a third one. And finally, he jumped out of state, went national, then overseas, went international, and five to six years later, sold it for an amazing sum of money to retire with almost a billion dollars in the bank. Now, having finished his story, he then said, I guess you're wondering where I got this bit of advice. Maybe you think my parents took me to China, to the Orient, and I got a hold of some ancient wisdom, or maybe from a fortune cookie. Or maybe you think that, that my parents bought some kind of CDs off of TV from these positive middle attitude people, and they were watching it, and I heard it when I was in first grade, but that's not where I got it. And at that moment, he reaches underneath the podium, and he pulls out a Bible. And he said, I actually came across this, this little advice for living in the New Testament, the second part of the Bible. The very first book is called Matthew. And in chapters 5 through 7, there's a sermon recorded by Jesus, and it's his most famous sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 5, 41, here's what it says. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them 
two miles. In other words, you do what's ever expected of it, you know, you finish it. There you go. I told you it was radical, didn't I? That right there is probably the most radical statement that Jesus ever made. Now you're looking at me like I'm about half crazy. What's so radical about it? I mean, just pull your car over, let the guy in, go the second mile. It's no big deal. It doesn't cost much gas, not much time, especially as fast as you drive. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, what's the big deal about that? We don't understand it at all, so it's not radical to us. So what we have to do is we have to look at the historical context. Did anyone besides me grow up in the 1960s? Do y'all remember the 60s? Anybody? <laughs> that might say a lot about you. Um, the 1960s were an interesting time because we all felt like and believed that there was a particular country that was going to drop atom bombs on us and, and, and hit us with atomic bombs. And so we would have bomb drills in school. Does anyone remember the bomb drills? Get under your desk. How brilliant is that when you're sitting in a classroom full of windows? You know what I mean? <laughs> we had these yellow signs that were fallout shelters. Normally they were on grocery stores that had glass fronts. They just wanted you to have, you know, plenty of food before you got nuked. So that, that's pretty much why they were there. Um, man, I remember lying in my bed as a kid, and I just pray. My dad was in the military, 42 years, retired colonel, and I was like, Lord, please don't let my dad have to go to war and fight the Russians. I don't want to go to war. Don't let the Russians come and take us over, please. I mean, I prayed fervently about that, almost as much as killing a deer, you know. And it was serious. So... It was amazing when in 1996, just eight years after the breakdown of the Iron Curtain, I got a phone call from the Minister of Religion of the Ukraine, old Russia. And he said, we have a severe problem with morals among our young people. And the average abortion rate is nine by the time a girl is 21. That's how they do birth control. And they're alcoholics. And all that. Would you be willing to come over here and teach on the Ten Commandments for two weeks? I was like, oh, yeah, I'll go. And I went over here by myself. It was crazy. I can't believe I did it. And I, I taught every day from 8 in the morning to late at night from Lenin's palace, from Lenin's podium on the Ten Commandments. And they put me on national television every night with the same program. They aired it for 30 straight days, two times a night, everywhere I went in, in Russia. People were like, oh, there he is. I, just, I could not believe the situation I was in. It was just surrealistic. I was on buses. I remember looking at a bus, and there goes my picture, and I'm like, what? This is crazy. But it was just one of those God things. He orchestrated it. I did it, and I told him a story one night. Through my translator, I said, you know, when I was a little kid, I prayed about you. And here's what I prayed. Oh, please don't let them kill us. We thought y'all were going to kill us. And then I, later on, I'm beginning to study the Bible, and I'm beginning to realize as a teenager that I'm supposed to pray for you. Pray for your enemies, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. But I think it's so fascinating that now, decades later, I'm here praying with you. And after I got through with that lesson that night, about 50 people my age were bombarding the stage. They, they were pressing in on me and they were all talking at once. And, and my translator's like, whoa. And I was thinking, man, I said something that really offended them. You know? and, and he's like, just slow down, slow down. And what it was is they were all saying, we thought the same thing about you. It's pretty amazing. Well, what if Russia had come in and taken over our country? Or well, let's make it more contemporary. What if ISIS somehow figured out a way to take Wisconsin and capture it without the U.S. military being able to come in and rescue from that situation? And, and any ISIS person on business could come to you and make you stop what you're doing and give you commands and you would have to obey them. How many of you would like that? It'd be a terrible situation, wouldn't it? Well, that's exactly what had happened to the Jewish people that lived in Israel. Rome had come in and had taken their whole country over. And whenever Rome would take over a country, they would build an arch, like the Arch of Titus that still exists in the city of Rome. And they would make you, the Jewish citizen, march under the yoke, or I'm sorry, under the archway, which would bind you under what they called the yoke of Rome, like the yoke on an ox. The Jews called it the yoke of oppression, and they hated the Romans. That's why they were always wanting Jesus to come along as the Messiah and raise a physical army and go kick the Romans out. Did you know that the Jewish 
person would have to stop whatever they were doing if any official Roman on business came by and made them carry their luggage. And the Jewish person would have to, by law, carry their luggage one mile. So the Jewish person would always have a marker from the front door of their house and from the front door of their business. And they would step off 5,280 feet and drive a peg there with their name on it. Those were the first original mile markers. And that way they would not have to take one single step past that stinking, oppressive law mile of those scumbag Romans. Are you beginning to see now how radical Jesus' words are? Jesus is there on the north hillside over Lake Tiberias, what we also know as the Sea of Galilee. There's this massive road that connects Asia to Africa that runs right by Capernaum. That's why the synagogue is five times bigger there than any other synagogue because a lot of people stayed there traveling through. It would swing between where Jesus was and the lake, just right down there a few hundred yards away. If you want to see it firsthand, I'm going to Israel in September of 2022. I'm taking another tour there. And we're going to teach uh, across Israel for about 10 or 11 days. Then we're going to go down to Jordan. We're going to ride camels through Petra and the Wadi Rum and stay where they filmed The Martian and Star Wars. We're going to go down to the Red Sea, to Aqaba from Aladdin, and go with me. It's a fun trip. I'm taking 30 people. Jesus is there. That big road's going along there. Biggest road in the whole um, half of, of, of that side of the world. That's where the Roman army would go. And Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount one day, and guess who decides to come by most likely? Here they come. A legion of Roman soldiers in their big uniforms with their spears and their swords and their helmets. And guess who's leading them? Big, bad centurion. And probably the Jewish people quit listening to Jesus for a minute and they turned around and all of a sudden all these Jewish people, thousands of them, <laughs> spitting in that direction. Maybe playing the Braveheart thing, mooning them. A lot of half peace signs flying in the air. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of words. Finally, they go by. Jesus lets it all happen. And he's like, okay. And he gets their attention back and he's like, all right. So, when that Roman centurion comes to you and forces you to go one mile, don't just go one mile. Go with him. What? Two, Two miles. miles. And this Jewish guy, he's standing there listening to Jesus and his jaw drops to the ground and he's digging the wax out of his ears. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he looks at his buddy standing there and says, did he just say what I think he just said? Are you kidding me? Those are traitor words. There's no way I'm doing that. He spits on the ground and he leaves. He's out of there. This is the guy who's at work one day in his garden. He's trying to get his garden all planted and he's got his hoe going and this... This man comes walking along on the dirt road, and it's a Roman centurion. He sees the Jewish guy. He goes, hey, Jewish guy, get over here and carry my bags. Well, he's got to do it. He throws his hoe down, and he goes over there, and he picks up the bag, and he half carries it and half drags it down the dirt road, and he's mumbling things under his breath that I can't repeat here. And finally, he comes to a peg in the road, and he turns around, and he slams the bag underground, and he looks at that Roman, and he points his finger at his face, and he says, let me tell you something. I'm never, ever going to forget your face. And one of these days when the Messiah comes and our people get out from underneath the stinking yoke of oppression of you people, you Romans, I'm going to hunt you down. I'm going to pay you back for what you've done. <laughs> Turns and leaves. Roman spits. Picks up his bag. Heads on down the road thinking, yeah, you people are just like what I've heard you're like. You're good for nothing. So the guy goes back, picks up his hoe. Have you ever tried to work when you're just steaming mad? Man, he can't get anything done right. He breaks his hole. He's got to go home early now. He has to come back later and fix his garden. So he goes home and he's still mad. The more he walks, the more he's mad he is. And he goes in his white picket fence gate and he slams it and breaks the hinge. Now he's got to go to Lowe's at Jerusalem and get a hinge and fix that. Now his little boy and girl are on the swing set. And they see daddy's home early. And they run over there all excited and they throw themselves around each leg. And he's like, oh, you, I, I'm, you just, I gotta go in. Y'all just go play. Just go play. I gotta go inside and rest. Now he goes in and he slams the screen door as he walks in the house. And his wife is, she's there at the kitchen and she's over the sink. She's washing some lettuce. She hears her husband come in. Oh, you're home early today. Why do you always nag at me? 
You just nag all the time. You think I don't work. Where is the dog? Can they talk, talk here without going to hell at an event like this? You have permission to talk. Where's the dog? Come on, where's the dog? Use your common sense. He sure ain't in that kitchen. He's in the back room. And he's hiding under the bed. You know why? Because nobody likes a one-miler. And dogs are the greatest predictors of character. One-milers are no fun to be around. They see things as a got to. They'd read the Bible and go, that's a law book. Now let's go back to that hillside and let's look at Jewish man number two. Jesus says that second mile thing, his jaw drops open, he's digging the wax, he looks at his buddy, he's like, did he just say that? That sounds like traitor words. Are you kidding me? <sighs> but you are the Messiah. If you say it's true, who am I to question? He's at work one day with his hoe. He's trying to get his garden all planted. He hears the voice. Roman centurion's walking down the gravel road. Hey, Jew, get over here. Carry my bag. Sets his hoe down. Hops over there. Grabs that bag. Throws it over his shoulder. Down the road he goes. He's almost skipping. He's whistling. Whistling. What is this? You're skipping while you work. He turns around. He says, hey, 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 come here. Come here. Of course, the, the, the Roman shoulder's not going to get near him. Come here. Just, just take a whiff. Ah, of course, the Roman soldier's thinking, you know, he just did something. And he goes, no, no, you've got you to understand, man, this place is amazing. My God calls this land the land flowing with milk and honey. Can you smell it? It's the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. And, of course, the centurion's thinking, drugs. i got a Jew on crack. Are you kidding me? This guy is nuts. <laughs> Well, on the, the road they go, and, and, the, and the Jewish man turns to the Roman man and says, hey, tell me about Rome. Man, I've always wanted to go to Rome. It must be amazing. What would a Roman centurion rather talk about than his home city of Rome? So he tells him about the gladiatorial combats. He's been there, you know, in the Colosseum. He talks about Caesar's palace. He's been there. And finally, the Roman stops the Jewish man and says, sir, I think we may have passed your peg in the road a good ways back. You've gone extra, and you know what? I'm keeping you from your work. And the Jewish man said, let me tell you something, sir. It is a beautiful day. I love the conversation. And your bag's not that heavy, and I need the exercise. Just tell me more. And off he goes. And the Roman tells him about the bathhouses and the Greek theaters and all the, the, this, the cultural events that are taking place there and the seven hills upon which Rome is built. It's amazing. And finally, the Roman soldier literally walks up to the Jewish man, takes the bag from him. He says, sir... I'm keeping you from your work. You've got to feed your family. You've gone a whole extra mile. I want to thank you. And the Jewish man says, Sir, it was an honor to carry your bag. And if you ever come through this region again, please find me. Give me the privilege of carrying your, your bag for you. <coughs> now, the next thing that happened may have never happened before, and maybe it never happened again in all of Israel. But had you been there that day, you would have seen that Roman soldier take off a glove and extend this gnarled hand. A hand that had been in many battles. A hand that had been in charge of some crucifixion crews, maybe even that one. And he shook the Jewish man's hand. You also would have seen something that you normally would never see in the tear duct of a Roman centurion. And that Roman man told that Jewish man, if you are ever in Rome, here's my card. I want you to contact me. I will take a day off, and I'll give you a personal tour of the city. They parted their ways, the Roman feeling very served and happy, the Jewish man feeling very happy because he had served. And he went back and he picked up his hoe and he began to work. Have you ever tried to accomplish work when you're really, really happy? He got it done early. Got to go home early. So he goes down, he can hear his kids playing, so he's sneaking in, eases the, the little gate shut, and the kids hear it, ah, dad's home, and they go throw themselves around his leg, and he does what every good parent will do, and man, he takes the first 10 minutes, and he's just rolling on the ground with them, getting all dirty, and he's playing. Finally, he pats him on the bottom and says, now y'all go swing, I need to go kiss your mama. 
So he sneaks in the screen door. She's at the kitchen. She's washing the lettuce, getting some food all cleaned up, and she hears a squeak. But before she even has time to turn around, he's kind of eased up behind her and put his arms around her waist, and he's kissed her right there under the right ear. It's his favorite spot to kiss her. And she says, oh, you're home early today. Yeah. You did it again, didn't you? Did what? Oh, you know what you did. You did it again. I don't know what you're talking about. You do too. You went the second mile again, didn't you? <laughs> How do you always know that? Oh, I can just tell. Where's the dog? <laughs> tail just wagging. Why? Because everybody loves a second miler. They're so much fun to be around. They bring out the best in life. They light the room up. I think Jesus knew what he was talking about. Because the concept, the philosophy, the principle of the second mile brings the best out in us. It makes you the best version of yourself that you can possibly be. But now here's the P.S. We have at least one young man in here who has no clue what a P.S. is. We used to write letters with pens. And when we would finish the letter and sign it, we might think of something else. Oh, I forgot to say. And so we just simply called it a postscript, and we abbreviated it. P.S. I really, really love you, or whatever it is, or P.P.S. Anybody do the P.P.S.? Did you ever do a P.P.P.P.S.? <laughs> Those are just extra little thoughts at the end. So let me give you my final little afterthought here. Not only... Does the second mile principle bring out the best in you? But as a general rule, it brings out the best in others. When I first was developing this lesson, I was actually a minister in the Dallas, Arlington, uh, Texas uh, region. And it was a Sunday night that I was supposed to deliver this for the first time. And there was going to be an elders meeting at 5 o'clock. We lived about 10 minutes from the church building. I could not find my keys. Not an unusual event in my house. And I'm trying to think of an illustration to fit right in here at this part of the lesson. I don't have it yet. And I'm scrambling upstairs. And I'm running down the stairs. My wife is pregnant at the time with our son. He's in the oven. And she's holding our little girl who at the time was two and a half in her lap reading a book to her down in the library. And she looks at me and says, Honey, before you leave, would you please carry the vacuum cleaner upstairs for me? And I stopped on about the third floor, and I thought to myself, Carrie, the vacuum cleaner, i got an elders meeting, and if you're late for that, you can get fired, because they can hire and fire, and I don't have the illustration in my lesson, and I can't find my... <clears throat> I, didn't, I just thought it. I didn't say it. And I stopped, and, and, and I, I... Okay, and so I grabbed the vacuum cleaner, which I had bought, by the way, as a very light vacuum cleaner, so a pregnant woman could carry it up the stairs. And I took it up there, and I set it down, and I ran back down the stairs, and I stopped in the same spot, and I said, Honey, and she probably expected me to say something negative, and I said, I'd rather carry that vacuum cleaner for you than any woman on earth. Big old smile spread. I went to the elders' meeting. I was only two minutes late. They didn't fire me. I presented my lesson. I gave that illustration about the vacuum cleaner. On Monday, my secretary counted them. We had either 20 women visiting my office personally or calling me on the phone, all from the church who had heard my lesson, and every one of them said the same thing. You did not go the second mile. You should have vacuumed while you were up there. <laughs> so I stand before you knowing the principle of not always doing it, right? But I can tell you this, when I do it, it, it really truly does bring the best out in me. Now, the PS to that is it will also, as a general rule, bring out the best in those around me. There was a lady who wanted a divorce, and she went to a, a Christian lawyer. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but there are some. And he's thinking, how can I keep this lady from getting a divorce? I know a little system that's worked a couple of times. I'll try it on her. And I said, lady, would you like a free divorce? Of course, she said, well, of course I do. I want a free divorce. Yeah, but there's a catch, isn't there? Yeah, there, there, there's a catch, but it's not a really a big deal. What do I got to do? What I want you to do is go home and treat your husband like a king for six weeks. You do that, you come here, I'll give you a free divorce. I'd rather go in debt for the rest of my life. I'm married to the most low-down, no-good, rotten scoundrel of a man that ever walked on this earth. Let me tell you something. If he had been in the Garden of Eden in place of Adam... 
The Bible wouldn't have that verse in it where God said it was good. I'll pay. He said, is it going to hurt him if you divorce him right now? No, it ain't going to hurt him. He hates me as bad as I hate him. Would you like to hurt him? Well, yeah, I'd like to hurt him. Treat him like a king for six weeks, then drop him like a hot potato. And she got this demonic look on her face as it sunk in. She shook that lawyer's hand and out the door she went. Six weeks later, knock on the door. Lawyer says, come in. It's the lady. He didn't say a word. He just pulled out this big old legal pad, had a whole bunch of red X's, signed at Texas. She pushed it back. I don't want a divorce. Lady, you're married to the most low-down, rotten, no-good scoundrel of a man. You better quit talking about my man like that. What are you talking about? Just shut up, I'll tell you. I did exactly what you said. I went home, I cleaned that house like it hadn't been cleaned in two decades. I took that nasty old bathrobe with all the moth-eating holes in it, threw it away, went to Walmart, got me a new one. I'd get up in the morning, brush my teeth, put on my makeup, comb my hair. That man would come home in the afternoon, I'd fix him a treat, then I'd make him his supper that he loved. I'd even at some point bring him his newspaper and his slippers. You are not going to believe what he did on the Friday of the third week. The man came home from work and took a shower. <laughs> and the next week, of all things, he comes down and sits in the same room where I'm cooking. Now, we didn't really talk much, but he sat there. But by the end of the week, he's talking. He's actually putting his paper down, and we're having a conversation. Then the next week, one night, instead of watching TV, he said, you want to sit by the fire, and we can just read and visit? And then about on Wednesday of that week, it was week number five, he said, would you like to go out on Friday night to our restaurant that we used to go to? We had not been out of the house together in 15 years, ever since the fire. And so we went to that same spot, and we sat at the same table where years earlier he had proposed to me, and he had a flower sitting there, which was the symbol of our love. And he had a guy come with one of those violins, and he played our song from way back. And we closed that restaurant down that night. They had to come tell us to leave. And we fell in love with each other all over again. And this week, there was a knock on my front door and I opened it and there was a dozen roses and inside was a card and he's inviting me to go on a cruise. He's going to call it our second honeymoon. I don't want a divorce. I love my husband. And he doesn't want a divorce. He loves me. It doesn't always work that way. And some of you in this room have been through a situation where you were the second miler and the third miler and the fourth miler and the fifth miler. And for some crazy reason, it just didn't work. I'm sorry. Sorry it didn't work, but I'm proud of you for at least doing it the right way and giving it a try. As a general rule, though, it does work. Because not only does it bring out the best in you, it brings out the best in others. So listen to the words of the very wise one, Jesus Christ. He knows what he's talking about. And his principle that he wants me to live with and that I think as his ambassador I'm sharing with you to live with is this. Do whatever's expected of you. Now you finish it. Amen. There you go. Let's pray. Father, we need help because we're selfish. We can be one-milers so often. Sometimes we look at life as a got-to, but we need to look at it as a get-to. And sometimes, Lord, we look at the, the Scriptures even and, and the things that you tell us that we need to do, and we see it as law, and we forget about all the love. So help us, Lord. Give us a, a brain surgery and heart surgery and help us make that journey that we need to make from one mile to two mile and help us to be two-milers. For your glory, so that we can be the very best person that you know we can be. And so that we can truly and positively impact others around us and help them as well. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right now, if you'll take out that little piece of paper that has a deer, duck, and a fish on the bottom. And I'm going to do something that I consider to be the most serious part of the whole time. There may be somebody here at this luncheon, just as there were yet, was yesterday down in Leclerc who has never really had much of a background <clears throat> with religion, with Christianity, maybe is a person who would not even consider themselves a Christian. If that is you, thank you for being here. It's awesome. I'm so glad you came. 
And uh, I hope you don't feel like that we're targeting you, uh, but we are. I'll just be very honest. We are. Uh, these luncheons are not just for guys in, of faith to get together and encourage each other, but we intentionally hope and pray that we can bring people in that are not Christians. So yeah, there, there's a target on you. So I'm, I'm naming that elephant in the room. But I want you to understand why there is. <laughs> it's not because we think we're better than you. It's because we are just like you, except for one difference. We've been saved from our sin because we are sinners in need of grace. And Jesus has died for us. And He's offered us a free gift. And He said, here's my blood. It will save you from all those sins you've done, including those really bad ones. And I'll give you eternal security, eternal life insurance. I'll give you a place in heaven for all of eternity. And you can get through all this chaos on earth with peace of mind and with joy that can't be robbed by circumstances. So the only difference is this. There are many of us in here who have accepted that gift and we can now bear the name of Christ. And so we're walking through life differently with a different attitude, with a different perspective, with an understanding that we're good. And so we want to share that. It brings so much joy that nothing on this earth can bring. There are, are no amount, there's no amount of physical possessions or anything that can bring the kind of joy that Christ can bring into one's life. And so we just want to share it. So it would be very selfish of us if we went on with life and didn't try to at least present that to you. So that's why we've, we've tried to get you here and thanks for coming. And I hope that that's not offensive to you, uh, but it's intentional. And, and I want you to consider giving your life to Christ just as He's already given His life to you. And if you'd like to know more about that, if you'd like to say, you know what, I'm ready to take that step on that form right there that you've already filled out, here's how we're going to do it. Let me know it and let Rich and the guys that run this event know it. Very privately, I'm not going to read your name, I'm not going to announce anything, you're not going to stand up, I'm not going to get you to raise your hand or anything. Just circle that deer. It's got a CC under it. I'm making a commitment to Christ for the first time in my life. Just circle it and fold it. Don't look at each other's papers if somebody starts writing. Just, just do it. And we'll be calling you. You're giving us permission to follow up with you, okay? We'll do it privately. Now you're saying, well, what are these other two things? One has an SN under it. What does that mean? That middle one. That means you have a spiritual need. Maybe you're going through a, a tough time in your marriage. Maybe you're, you've got kids that are driving you crazy and you need help on raising kids. Maybe you've lost your job. You don't know how you're going to feed those kids. Well, guess what? There's a band of brothers in here called the church. And it is our responsibility to meet physical needs of people within our communities. And we are going to help you. But we don't know to help you if you don't let us know. But I can promise you there will be follow-up. Am I holding you accountable, Rich? Are you going to hold the other men accountable here? Anybody in this room willing to help somebody? There you go. But you've got to let us know. And that goes along with that last one as well, the physical needs. You just may have physical needs and that's all. You may be fine spiritually or you may not be. You can circle more than one thing. But if you have a physical need, overcome the pride because we men don't like to ever admit that we have a need. Just overcome that silly little pride and just let people know. Let us know that you have something that you need help with and we'll privately come to you and we'll help you with it, okay? Because that's what brothers do. All right. So once you've filled that out, um, if you will please send that forward. Or actually, I think we're going to have somebody collect it. We're going to draw some prizes from those, okay? So make sure you have filled those out. Okay, guys, that's all we got for today. Make sure you come up and check out Jimmy's books and his videos. And let's give an round of applause for Jimmy Sykes, you guys. Yeah.